Hello and welcome to the basic building blocks of the industrial stormwater general permit. Um, this is a workshop sponsored by the Boeing Company and is put on by ECOS and the Washington Stormwater Center in cooperation. We are excited to bring you this. This is um, a very basic start to the general permit and uh, we hope that it will be a good stepping stone for you to get more information later. Um, a, oop, a few uh, tips for the uh, Zoom logistics. This is being recorded. We will share it with you later. All attendees are muted and have their video off. We'll have about a five minute Q&A and a five minute break after each approximately 30 minute presentation. We have no idea how long each section is going to go or how this whole thing will go. So please bear with us as we go through this process for the first time. Um, you can ask questions in the toolbar. Uh, you can see there's a Q&A here. And you can use that to ask questions of the presenters. If you have questions uh, dealing with technology or anything, please use the chat button and you can speak to Lauren, our host, who I'll introduce in a minute. You are... My name is Ann Boyce. I'm with ECOS. I'm the Stormwater Outreach Program Manager. I've been there since 2011 and been managing the stormwater industrial workshop since then. I also host municipal stormwater training programs. Um, we also work with non-permitted businesses dealing with stormwater issues, and we have a host of other different types of things that I have worked with businesses on. ECOS is a nonprofit. We are all about education and not about going after businesses. So we want to support you in meeting your permit needs, and that's what we're here for. Stormwater is just one of our areas that we work with businesses. We do provide outreach and education, on-site technical assistance. We have an incredibly diverse staff of between 12 and 15 languages. So if you have employee training that might be needed um, in different languages, please feel free to uh, reach out to us and see if we might support that. I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa for a minute. Hi, good morning. This is Lisa Rosman with the Washington Stormwater Center. Um, just a little bit about the center. Uh, we, um, sorry, this is a little, I'm a little bit um, electronically challenged and so please bear with me. Um, but the Stormwater Center was started in 2010 um, by the legislature and um, businesses like you were saying that they needed help and they wanted help that was non-regulatory, um, neutral third party. Um, and so that's how the uh, Stormwater Center was formed. And I really I apologize, my cat and my dog, this is all very new for me, so I apologize profusely. Um, but we're gonna get through this and it's gonna be a great day. So thank you so much for joining us today. And this is Lori Larson. She is our Rockstar Municipal Program um, Manager, and she works with municipalities across the um, Washington State to make sure that they are able to comply with and manage, uh, comply with their municipal stormwater permit. Um, she works with uh, municipal groups uh, across the state to help them um, with their uh, their permit and their permit needs. And she also organizes a conference every two years called MuniCon. Um, and it specifically focuses on priority issues and challenges that municipalities have with their MS4 permit. And this is well, again, this is who we are. Um, we offer stormwater management help. We are a free um, service. We are a part of Washington State University um, and our facility is located, our campus is located in Puyallup, Washington.
Thank you, Lisa. Um, for those of you who are getting assistance or have re received Zoom information, this is who you're receiving it from. Lauren is an awesome guru tech person. And if you have any questions, again, communicate with her on chat. She's been working with us on these webinars and has done a great job. And we really appreciate her presence here today. So let's talk a little bit about the workshop. Um, this workshop is about fulfilling a need for industry. In approximately 2006, after the 2005 permit was um, implemented, uh, several, uh, a number of businesses were asking for assistance. And so we developed this program specifically initially for auto recycling yards. Um, since then, we've expanded it to all the businesses that have uh, industrial permits. We partner with a technical team to create this program. We try to make it as comprehensive as possible and for people on the ground making decisions. But we also encourage you, especially this initial um, basic building blocks class, to share this with your, um, the, the people that assist you. You do not want to be the only person to be make, managing this permit. You need backup if you get sick, if, you get, um, if you're on vacation, or if you leave. There needs to, to be some institutional knowledge and support for the program. The typical attendee for these workshops is you have generally have about less than two years, often one year or even just starting with no engineering or science background. We realize that this permit is very technical. It's almost like another language. It is another language. It can take years to fully understand all the uh, language and acronyms. And as such, we do provide you with an acronym sheet to help you decode the language. Um, so we try to make this accessible to the layperson. We're here to empower you with knowledge and tools to help you have a successful program for your facility and help you comply with the industrial permit requirements. We will be providing you with a resource link after the class, um, once you've completed the class evaluation. Uh, that has a lot of valuable information, it has permit information, forms, template, guidance documents, and more. And so it's a really valuable tool that is worth your time to look through and to receive. So what we're going to talk about today is stormwater and why it's a problem. We're going to go through the SWIP, sampling, um, BMPs, and resources and wrap up. Again, this is a high level overview. If you need more in-depth information, we do have other programs that can support you. First of all, it's really important to understand what stormwater is. It's rain, snow, hail, sleet, whatever. And after it melts, it goes across the ground and into the storm system. Why is that a problem? Well, as it flows across the ground, it picks up pollutants and mostly goes untreated into storm systems, eventually ending up in local water bodies, your local lakes, creeks, rivers, and eventually Puget Sound or the ocean, depending where you're at. Stormwater pollution is the number one toxic threat to Puget Sound. And that's why it's important that you manage your stormwater pollution. In 1972, the Clean Water Act was established to manage stormwater quality and quantity. If you look at the picture in the upper right, that is the Duwamish River after several days of rain. It literally looks like mud flowing. This is caused by erosion and either on construction site or just stream bank erosion. So you have high turbidity, the organisms that, and salmon that live in these waterways can't see. It also, they can't see to eat and they also can't breathe as well either. This abrades their gills and can cause suffocation. It also overwhelms our drainage systems and can cause overflows. 
You also have issues such as galvanized surface edge, which is have zinc in them. We'll talk about that a bit later. And also vehicle and equipment fluids and tires. Um, WSU through the Washington Stormwater Center is actually finding out that a high percentage of chemicals in our stormwater come from tires and they're proprietary. And so we don't know exactly what a lot of them are, but it is causing major problems for the health of our waterways. Stormwater is not process water. Process water is things like washing down equipment, um, you know, uh, washing off fruit or vegetables, those kinds of things. If you have any process water, that should not be commingling with your stormwater. Wastewater does not. That is usually directly connected to your sewer system and is treated at treatment plants. And it is not groundwater. So only water that originates as precip precipitation is what stormwater is. Just to give you an example of, there's two different systems. There's the municipal stormwater, excuse me, municipal storm, separate storm and sewer systems, where everything from your homes, from your business, goes to a treatment plant and gets treated. Everything from roadways, parking lots, um, local fields, uh, your home, your yard, goes into our local storm system, which goes out into our local waterways. There are places in Seattle area anyway, and some older cities that have a connected system, which is called the combined sewer overflow system. Everything from businesses and homes and things go to treatment, and the storm system is connected to that treatment also. But when we have some large storms like we do these days, it can cause an overflow which can go out into our local waterways, causing untreated sewage as well as stormwater to impact the qual quality of our stormwater, our, our local waterways. I'm going to show you a real quick video that kind of explains a bit more about stormwater. is stormwater runoff a problem? On the one hand, it's just water, right? But in an urban environment, stormwater runoff is a problem because this is not a forest. This is. Fall brings rain here. It falls from the sky, melts from the mountains, and runs through our communities. Trees, people, and salmon, from the peaks of the mountains to the depths of Puget Sound, we're all connected by the water that runs through this magical place. When salmon return from the ocean, they bring back nutrients that feed the river and forest ecosystems. From mayflies and trout to eagles and bears, even the trees feed on salmon. They also feed us. When we built our cities, we weren't thinking about salmon. And when we covered our cities with concrete and asphalt, the rain could no longer soak down into the forest floor. Instead, the rain picks up toxic pollution from the concrete and asphalt and flushes it right into fish habitat. You could see particulates like sand in stormwater runoff. What you can't see are toxics like fossil fuels, plastics, pesticides, metals, and bacteria. Stormwater runoff is a problem in cities around the world. But here in the Pacific Northwest, it's an acute problem for what remains of our salmon runs. Part of our work has been to see how salmon are affected by urban runoff. Coho salmon in particular spend much of their lives in fresh water compared to other types of salmon, and they need cool, clean water to thrive. In a very simple experiment, we collected runoff from a busy highway in Seattle. Some salmon were placed in clean well water. Others were placed in the collected stormwater runoff. 100% of the salmon in the stormwater died.
the fish in the clean water all lived. So you're seeing 60, 70, 80 percent of the fish entering that system to spawn are dying before they get a chance to spawn. A normal rate of pre-spawn mortality would be like 1 percent of the population might die before they get a chance to spawn. We used to think physical habitat restoration was what salmon needed to recover. We now know it's much more complex than that. Controlling sources of toxic chemical runoff into our urban creeks is crucial to the solution. After a grueling journey back to their native stream to spawn, toxic runoff causes the salmon to become slow and disoriented. They lose their ability to swim and eventually expire, the females still full of eggs. And for the few in the next generation that manage to survive. We see effects on the heart, and inside that bubble under the fish is where the heart is developing. And stormwater runoff will cause swelling in that area. That's pericardial edema. And edema happens in humans, too, and it tends to be associated with heart failure. Coho salmon have returned to the Pacific Northwest to spawn for six million years. Given the impacts of urban runoff, is there anything we can do to keep them coming back to developed areas? The answer is yes. Our research team passed stormwater runoff through a simple filtration system made of sand and compost. We then tested whether the water was still toxic to salmon. 100% of the coho salmon tested in the filtered water survived, every time. A soil system like the one we used in our experiments is an example of green infrastructure. Using nature as a filter, diverting runoff and using absorbent soils in this way is not the norm, but it is slowly gaining popularity in cities, and we are showing that it can work. In urban areas, green infrastructure like rain gardens and green roofs can act as filtration systems, removing toxic pollution from stormwater runoff, preventing it from reaching streams. This is a message I've been speaking about for some time. No one anticipated the intense toxic response that urban stormwater would have on coho salmon, nor how simple it could be to remove that toxicity. Really, it's just helping our hard urban landscape act more like the forest floor, letting the rainwater soak into the soil. It's not like we can tear down all of our cities and return to the forest that was there previously, but I think there's a lot we can do. We can go a long way towards helping these systems act more like the forest. These animals are treasures to us here. Economically, culturally, and ecologically, they are critical. But it takes more than will alone. It takes action. We can't afford to lose these species. Their well-being is an indicator of our own well-being as a species. We can't go back. But we can do what must be done now to go forward. So as um, Jen was talking about, there's a lot of non-point source pollution sources. It's general and we can't pinpoint it. It comes from cars, farmland, septic tanks, sediment, a lot of things we can't necessarily directly manage. But you, your business is a point source of pollution. It's identifiable, it has a subscribed property line, and we know that a pipe, drain, channel, or sheet flow comes off your property <clears throat> into local stormwater systems. The Clean Water Act requires that our waterways are fishable and swimmable in perpetuity. And as such, your business is performing an activity or, or activities that require you to have a permit to address point source pollution. And that's why you have a permit. The reason why is you've got huge human impact. You have, you, you can't swim, you can't eat the contaminated fish at times, and there's bioaccumulation in fish over and other types of shellfish. 
It also impacts the economy. Municipalities are having to clean out storm lines and storm drains. They have to pay for public outreach and education and training. They also have to deal with uh, remediation and habitat projects. As construction companies and developers develop the land, there's stricter regulations dealing with new development and there's also retrofitting costs for existing facilities. A lot of low impact development like rain gardens are necessary. It also impacts jobs. Uh, as you can see, gooey ducks uh, were rejected by China at one point because of the toxicity in them. You also know that salmon is a high priority in the Northwest and it, it draws a lot of people from literally around the country and around the world to go fishing. If those things drop off, it impacts our local economy. As Jen was talking about, there's a high incidence of pre-spawn mortality in urban streams. There are some streams that have 90 to 95% die off before spawning. So that's a huge impact. It also impacts uh, drinking water. It impacts recreational water use. And it also, as I mentioned earlier, contaminates shellfish. Orcas are one of the most the most polluted organisms in the world, and those are the Puget Sound orcas. And as you're probably aware, it also impacts industries such as yourselves. Stormwater pollution was only recognized recently as a problem, and that's why as we go through, uh, in 2000, in 2000, 2005, the issues were um, oily sheen, uh, pH, uh, and, and, and gradually we've added different metals and we've now started adding PCBs and other things that impact. So more facilities are required to have structural or treatment BMPs to address that, which impacts your pocketbook. You've also got a lot of legacy pollutants from historical industry and that is needing to be cleaned up as well. So it impacts your financial bottom line. So that's the end of the stormwater section. Are there any questions? There aren't any questions. Okay. Why don't we take a 10 minute break and come back at 9.35. Okay, we're gonna get started. I apologize, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties. So Anne is gonna control the, uh, the slides for me. Um, so I just wanted to um, reiterate what Anne, Anne talked about this morning a little bit in that um, we wanted to start with the why of stormwater. We think it's important for people to know why they have to manage their stormwater and why they are um, having, to, um, having to have this permit. So, so I think that was really important. And so that was the first step. So we're going to dive into one of the most important parts of the permit, and that's your stormwater pollution prevention plan. So the required elements um, in, from the permit, it's on page 10 of the permit, um, that talk about the specific requirements. But there's six elements. Um, the site map, the detailed facility assessment, which we're going to go through both of those things at the um, at the facility uh, exercise after lunch, um, the pollution prevention team, a description of your BMPs, and there are mandatory BMPs and then those that are specific to your facility operations. Um, spill prevention and emergency cleanup plan and your sampling plan. And I just wanna reiterate that, um, I'm sorry, Ann, can you go back? Thank you. So I just wanna reiterate that these are the basic building blocks, but your facility um, is unique. And so when you are going through these, ex these um, exercises, please think about your own facility and um, how you might apply what you're learning today to your own facility. Thank you. Okay, so what is your stormwater pollution prevention plan? Or we, um, we like to have lots of acronyms and so we call it a SWIP. Um, it establishes your stormwater management program. It's the, um, it's the basic backbone of your stormwater management permit, uh, or excuse me, your stormwater management in compliance with your permit. 
So it's a tool to help you meet and maintain permit compliance. Um, and one of the things we need to really keep in mind is that it's a living document and it has to be kept up to date with any changes or updates um, to the required elements. Um, ecology, Department of Ecology has a great SWIP template um, and it's a great place to start, but as you go through it, and it's part of the package that we'll be sending out the link for um, after the, the webinar. Um, it's a good place to start, but you have to make sure that what the permit says is implemented or change it to be more site specific. Remember, you have to have your, um, your SWIP be very specific to your facility. Um, and failure to develop and maintain your SWIP in accordance with the permit is a permit violation. So you need to remember that. All right, so we're going to talk about the site map um, and the elements that go into the site map. And then keep, please keep this in mind for when we, um, when we have that exercise this afternoon. So you must know your site and understand it with 100% confidence. You need to know everything about your site. Um, it's crucial to identify all those potential pollutant sources. We're gonna um, show another video about um, pollutant sources in a little while. Um, and it's the foundation and narrative in your SWIPs excuse me, it's the foundation of the narrative in your SWIP. So everything you do should be um, part of your site map. All right, so the requirements are the scale or distances between points, um, and that's like between the building and the fence line, um, between your, um, your property line and, the, um, and your catch basins, that sort of thing. Um, so how many acres you have, um, locations of buildings, structures, impervious surfaces. You want to mark all of those on your map. And the BMPs, both structural and treatment that you use, um, should be also part of your, your site map. Um, drainage and conveyance. This is sometimes kind of tricky because um, when you inherit a site, if you didn't build the site, you might know not know where your drainage goes. Um, you might not have the as built or you may have the as built and they're not correct. So knowing where your drainage system and your, your stormwater conveyance systems are is really important to know where your stormwater goes. Um, and the discharge points. So where you have stormwater leaving your facility, you want to note those discharge points and with a unique identification. And those might be um, a, a pipe, um, sheet flow, a swale, something like that. You have to note those on your site map. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about your drainage and conveyance. So you want to locate inlets and outfalls. So all your catch basins, all your downspouts, um, surface discharge, it, it, are your um, downspouts a surface discharge or are they piped directly into the stormwater system? Um, any area where stormwater will infiltrate, you need to mark that. Um, determine the location of your outfalls and where runoff and run on might affect your property. So anywhere your, um, your stormwater leaves your site, but also where your neighbor's stormwater might come onto your, your facility. Um, surface stormwater flow direction, so you need to know um, in a rain event where your stormwater is flowing and how it flows and the location of surface waters in the vicinity. So you, if you have a wetland next door um, or a river or creek nearby, you need to mark those as well. Okay, so here is an example of a basic um, site map. And this one has just the basics on it. We have not yet filled in all of the um, things that need to be on a site map. So as you can see, there's a major highway um, to the north, there's a wetland to the um, to the east, um, and it looks like your stormwater is connected to that wetland next door. So you want to be aware of that. You have a fueling station that also has some catch basins associated with it, um, and there's an industrial business, a machining company next door. Uh, so you need to be aware of that. Also, your other neighbor is um, an auto storage yard, so there may be some problems if you get run on from their facility. Okay, so you know the distances. So the distances from the buildings, et cetera, um, 
and make sure that um, that those distances are accurate. Um, go ahead and go to the next one. All right, and you have to uniquely name your catch basins. So um, on this slide, it's A through L. You can call them um, whatever you'd like, as long as you uniquely name each of those. Um, and you want to show the general direction of your stormwater flow. So as you can see in this, the blue arrows are showing where the stormwater is flowing. Um, and if you have some problems, like looks like some of the flow may be in the lower, um, lower right corner, maybe bypassing that catch basin and flowing into the wetland, you need to make sure that you berm that area to make sure you're not um, affecting that wetland. All right, so the other things you need to, to, um, to identify, not only those pipes and catch basins, but any sheet flow um, and any run on areas of concern that may have um, pollution sources other than just stormwater, um, like the fueling station and where that outflow is. All right. Um, show uh, where your stormwater leaves your property. So we talked a little bit about this. If your stormwater is leaving your property inappropriately and affecting other facilities, you need to be aware of that. Um, making sure that it's not going into um, inappropriate places like the wetland, that's all important. It needs to be on your site map as well. All right, so we talked about the site map. Please think about um, your, um, your facility when we go through the facility assessment. Okay, so this is required element two of your SWIP and the facility assessment is a description of your facility and your industrial activities. So um, it's, it's, um, it's your, the description of your facility and what you'll wanna do is take an inventory of facility activities, all of the equipment and materials that could cause you to have pollution problems. So anything that's a source of pollutant, you wanna note those and potentially, if you can, eliminate those. Um, but you wanna make sure that your facility is thoroughly inspected so you know where those areas of, um, of pollution runoff might be a problem. All right, so you assess your facility for sources of pollution. And that is sometimes, sometimes we're so, um, we look at things so often that we don't really see what's happening. And so put on your, um, your new eyes for inspecting your facility and making sure that you really look at things with an eye toward what could cause pollution in your stormwater runoff. So those things might be, you know, obvious things like fuels and solvents and coolants and how you store those things. Um, it may be um, your raw product or your final products that you store outside that may be causing pollution problems. Um, scrap metals and products that are, that are metal. Any chemicals that are stored outside could be a problem. Um, and so many, many of these are sort of, um, sort of obvious, but making sure that you're really looking at them with that, with that eye. Um, again, you might have a, like in the, um, the lower picture, you might have a pile of um, so galvanized, this is not galvanized, but um, galvanized materials that are outside and you see it every day and you don't think of it as a pollution source, you think of it as part of your product or part of your um, facilities um, uh, raw materials. So looking at things with, an, with the inspector's eye of stormwater is gonna be really important. All right, so high risk activities. Um, loading and unloading of products. Again, making sure that you, when you unload products, if there's potential for spill or um, material getting into the storm drain, you need to make sure that you are managing that. Um, vehicle and building equipment washing. Remember Anne talked about what is and what is not stormwater. This is one of those things that we need to make sure we are remembering only rain down the drain. So if you're washing your vehicles outside or your building um, or equipment, that needs to be managed separately from your stormwater runoff. So that cannot go in the storm drain. That is not stormwater and can be um, a violation of your permit. Um, landscape and maintenance areas. Um, I often see people that 
have recently landscaped and the bark or new soil is left to run off into the storm drain, that can cause you a turbidity problem. Um, and that could be something that is easily um, fixed. Outdoor manufacturing or repairs. So again, um, you can see that guy is doing some repair on his vehicle. Um, and that is something that could cause some pretty serious problems if you are not careful. Doing those things indoors is always a better idea. Um, outdoor storage of drums or containers, you need to make sure that those are um, managed properly if you're loading or unloading anything from those containers that you don't spill. Um, and again, pressure washing, that is also not a, um, a stormwater activity, that's a wastewater activity. And I'm gonna get a little bit of water because I seem to be losing my voice a little bit, so I apologize. Okay, so again, those high risk areas that you should look out with an eye toward um, pollution sources, outdoor storage areas, fueling stations, parking lots can even be a problem if people are um, having drips and spills, um, loading docks and dumpster areas. Dumpsters are often one of those things, it, again, easily fixed, um, keep it closed so that no water gets in, you don't get dumpster juice running into your um, storm drains and or catch basins and it's actually required as part of the mandatory BMPs in your permit that you keep those dumpsters closed unless you're adding material. All right, so assess your equipment. Um, you need to make sure that the, th the equipment that you have on site, even you know fleet vehicles, your, oh, that looks like a Department of Ecology vehicle, um, your bulldozers, any forklifts um, are maintained properly not only could they be, um, you know, drips and spills from those um, pieces of equipment, but it could also be that if you are doing any kind of maintenance outside, that could cause pollution problems as well. Okay, these are the things that we don't think about very often. Our buildings themselves, um, roofs, siding, HVAC systems, and downspouts. So, those are things that often are a source of zinc pollution. So you need to think about whether or not your, um, your roof is um, you know, a galvanized material, um, whether or not your downspouts are galvanized, um, and making sure that even if your roof material itself isn't a problem, there could be you know, flashings or HVAC systems that are galvanized, causing you to have an exceedance of zinc. Okay, so the other requirement of the site map and the facility assessment is that you break your site into sub basins. So where is where is your stormwater flowing, which you've already looked at, and so break it down into those sub basins of drainage. So where each of those sub basins will drain to off site, and this is an example of that. There are four of them in this photo, um, and again, you need to know. Um, where each of those sections is draining to. Okay, your pollution prevention team. This is also very important. Um, I apologize profusely. It looked like we were supposed to have a break. Anne, can you address that? I think we don't need a break, right? I'm looking at the agenda, I apologize. Lauren, can you unmute Anne? Keep going, it's almost there. Okay, I apologize. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so, <clears throat> all right. So the SWIP requirement element three is your pollution prevention team. Now, there's gonna be times when the person that is responsible and manages your stormwater is not available um, and there's also going to be times when um, you need other folks to help you um, with your stormwater management. So you need to have um, a list of folks that are available um, and that are able, that understand the permit, know your SWIP, and um, know how to respond to an emergency or do um, inspections while you're not there. So um, you need to list 
the names and phone numbers and emails, um, who the team lead is, how you contact them, so all of their contact information, and maintain training documentation for each of those, those team members. So every year you need to train those folks, and I, we'll talk about training a little later, um, but those folks need to have documentation that shows that they know the SWIP, um, your BMPs, and any management um, issues you may have on site. All right. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> I was waiting for that slide. Okay. So um, it looks like we, I think we had a question come up. Is that correct, Lori? No, we did not. Oh. It was oh, okay. a comment. It was just a comment that said, thank you. Oh, okay. All right. Great. Thank you so much. All right. So are there any questions now? There is a question now. What is the appropriate training needed for pollution team members? Okay, yeah, let's talk about that. Um, I think we're going to talk about that in detail a little bit later, but yeah, let's talk about that. So what is required is yearly, you need to, um, to train them on your SWIP in particular. So they need to know all of the elements of the SWIP. Um, they also should, it, every, anytime you make a change to any of your BMPs or your standard operating procedures that deal with stormwater, you need to make sure that all of your team is um, apprised of that change. So they, every year you need to go over the SWIP and make sure that they, they, um, that they know the SWIP in detail. Ann, do you have anything to add to that? Oh, okay, go ahead, Ann. Um, I would say that uh, there is information in the resource link that we'll be sending you. Um, it's important, we'll be talking about it later, but you're going to have a team that supports you outside of the general population. But the more staff, if not all staff, that are trained in understanding what's going on, the more likely they will respond, they'll understand why they need to respond, and they'll be empowered to respond or at least contact somebody so it can be respond, a spill can be responded to. Um, I don't know how many times I've been in presentations like this when, um, when it's like a, a full business and we at, or, or a, a city and we say, so if there's a spill, do you know who to contact? And there's just blank looks on people's faces. You don't wanna have that happening. You want, the more the merrier when it comes to the people who know what's going on on site so that it can help you manage your program and meet your compliance requirements. So we're going to be talking about best management practices and breaking these down. Um, basically, best management practices are about prevention. There's three types, operational, structural, and treatment. And in this SWIP, you need to describe your BMPs that you select and make sure that they're not contributing to violations of the stormwater quality. The SWIP needs to explain in detail how and where your selected BMPs will be implemented. As um, Lisa mentioned earlier, it's really important that you are clear in these and that they're applicable to your site. A lot of places that have multiple locations will often have a cookie cutter SWIP. It's important that your SWIP is for your site because you can get in trouble if uh, a site in Ohio is required to do something that you don't need to do or vice versa. Um, you, that can be a violation. So please make sure your SWIP reflects the BMPs that you need and that you implement all that you require. Also, you need to implement all known available and reasonable methods of prevention, control, and treatment. That's called ACART, and that's a term that you can look into in more detail in online. But basically, you want to be able to use all possible options for treatment of your stormwater pollution. So the first grouping is your operational BMPs. These are your good housekeeping, prevention, maintenance, illicit discharge detection, 
uh, spill prevention, employee training, and your inspections, reporting, and record keeping. So first, your good housekeeping are those things that you do on an ongoing basis. They're daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and annual basis. And it's dependent on the need and your requirements. One of the biggest ones is gonna be your friend is sweeping. You need to do it once a quarter. Now, hopefully most of you are aware that September 1st is, uh, it, it used to be that the first flush event was October 1st and you needed to sample that first flush. It's been moved back to September 1st. That means you're getting it in a time where in July and August, you've had a lot of dusts and metals and things accumulating on your surfaces. So I would encourage you to schedule a vacuum sweeper towards the end of August so that you're ready for that first flush event in September. Another one is your dumpsters. You need to make them, you need to have them covered. They should be resistant, have a resistant lid. They should not leak. Um, in fact, it is uh, mandatory, uh, it's supposed to be anyway, that your waste management company should replace those if the lids aren't working properly and or they're leaking. You want to clean up spills and garbage immediately and not let that accumulate. And tarps are not considered storm resistant. So for preventative maintenance, you want to describe your BMPs that you're going to use to inspect and maintain your stormwater conveyance system and identify all your equipment and materials that could cause problems and contribute to your pollutants for stormwater. Your mandatory BMPs include uh, pond maintenance, vaults, oil water separators, in accordance with ecology stormwater manuals. I want to note that a lot of times I talk to businesses that have oil water separators and I ask when they've last maintained them. They say, oh, you're supposed to maintain them? <laughs> a lot of them, or most of them, the requirements are that you should maintain them at least once every six months. That's pulling them apart, cleaning them out, and then putting them back together. Be careful though, because sometimes if they don't put the plates in correctly, it doesn't help you. One note on pond maintenance, it's incredibly important for you to keep your as-builts for future reference. You do not want to be in a position where you have a pond and you don't know if it has a liner or not. Because that first shovel that breaks through that liner is going to increase the cost of your pond maintenance tremendously. So make sure you keep your as-builts. You want to inspect and maintain your storm systems, including your lines, as well as your catch basins. These need to be done on a regular basis. Um, municipalities often say clean your catch basins at 60% of sump or 600, six inches below the outlet, whichever works. Uh, but you may want to do that more often because if you have a large amount of sediment in your system, it can impact your uh, water quality sampling results. You want to make sure that if you have any particular equipment that might leak, you want to check those for leaks monthly. Um, you should separate them into an area that won't impact your stormwater if you are having leaks until they are fixed. You also want to clean up leaks and spills immediately, and you should have a team that can address that situation. Illicit discharges are another thing that you need to be careful of. You want to make sure that you don't have any vehicle or equipment washing, steam cleaning, pressure washing, or other activities which are considered process water to not go down the storm drain. That needs to be separated. It should go into a sewer system. You also, during the dry season, want to take a walk on your property and make sure that you're not hearing any flowing water. There should be no flowing water during the dry season. If you're hearing it, that could be a connection either from your building, from another property, from sewer. It could cause you some major issues. 
Okay, so there's a difference between the SPCC, which is the Spill Prevention Control and Countermeasures Plan, and the SPECP, which is your Spill Prevention and Emergency Cleanup Plan. You are required to have an SPECP, regardless of whether you have an SPCC or not. The SPCC is for above ground storage tanks of 1,320 gallons or, and or uh, 42,000 gallons below ground. And it's not just about oil. They need to have a stamp from an engineer. Your SPECP does not need an engineering stamp and it needs to address all substances that could cause pollution to your stormwater. You want to have secondary containment. You need to have BMPs that prevent and clean up spills. You need to have a spill control. You need to have spill cleanup materials, uh, such as pads and socks and booms. You want to know how you're going to dispose of your contaminants and control those. You should replenish all your spill response materials. And you can actually either put a mark on your spill kits such that if they're not lining up you know somebody got in there or perhaps put a easy breakaway zip tie on your spill kits so that you know if it's broken somebody's used it you need to make sure that you inspect that on a regular basis just to make sure that you're prepared when a spill occurs and people should let you know if they use it. Don't be surprised. You should not be being surprised. One of the things you can do is use berms on your site or on your building. You can use them to cover um, exits such that you can use your building as containment, secondary containment. You also want to plug your drains when you're doing uh, fueling to make sure that you don't have, if you have an incident, it doesn't go down the drain and you can capture it. An easy way to do that is to install a thick six milliliter plastic bag underneath the storm drain lid. That will allow you to kind of create an inexpensive, easy to apply plug so that uh, it's easy to remove and inexpensive. You should have a group of spill response personnel. They need to be identified in your SWIP and you should have a training schedule. I encourage you guys to actually have a demo. Um, one of the things that I do uh, for businesses is um, provide a demo using both universal and oil only spill kit materials. Um, it really helps hit home how you want to use different types of materials for different types of spills. The oil only of course would be used for oil based spills and is really helpful when it's raining or there's water on the ground. Um, it will absorb the oil and leave the water. So if you got a spill inside your storm drain, you could literally toss the oil only pad into the storm drain to soak up oil. Whereas if you toss a universal pad in there, it would soak up all the water and sink and not do you any good. An example was I got a call in the middle of a massive rainstorm and they'd had a hydraulic leak and they couldn't find any oil only kit, spill kits and they had used all the universal kits. They pumped out all their water into a container and just to, just to contain the oil. And um, it, they did find an oil only kit. It was an old one, but it still works. So it's really important that you have the right tool for the job. You wanna List all of your BMPs and spill kits and create a map of their locations. Um, and my apologies. And 
and you also want to have a spill prevention and cleanup plan. This plan should include your business contact information, your um, who should be called on site, your business owner or site manager, who should be called for the spill cleanup as the spill cleanup coordinator, also the municipality spill hotline, and um, the Department of Ecology spill hotline to report. You should also have a list and acknowledgement of all the activities, equipment, and uh, materials that could cause problems. The spill kit should be located within 25 feet of fueling areas, including mobile fueling. So if you have a mobile fuel truck, you want to, um, you want to have a spill kit on the mobile fueling truck. You should have absorbance of at least 15 gallons of fuel. You should have a storm plug or cover. As I mentioned, you could use a six milliliter bag that with a storm drain pole, it's relatively easy to um, implement and plug the drain. You should have containment booms of at least 10 feet long and able to absorb at least 12 gallons. A non-metallic shovel to deal with things and two five gallon buckets with lids to put any materials that you use to absorb any spills into if there is a spill. Here's an example of how you can set up uh, locations that you can put your uh, spill kits so that um, you can have a map showing where they're all located. If there is a spill, people know where to go to respond to a spill. You want to have employee training on an annual basis and all new hires so that um, even if they're a new hire, they should know how to respond. You want to incorporate it in safety meetings. You can do this on a regular basis, maybe even just have some questions or quick tidbits that you can share about things. As I said earlier, do a practice run, get some hands on activity, buy a kit that you can just replenish that you can demo with so that people can see how to do it. It's great to do in small groups and people really enjoy it. I usually do um, have uh, one drain, two bottles of uh, colored water and an oil kit and a oil only kit and a universal kit on either side of with those uh, each stream and then I have two people pull the lid and place the plug, two people respond with the oil only and two people respond with the universal materials. It's a great opportunity for some hands-on activity and people really enjoy it and they also feel empowered to respond if there is a spill. You want to go over the SWIFT as Lisa mentioned. Be conscientious of the language gaps. As I said earlier, the permit and the SWIP, they're like foreign languages. So make sure that you come to a layperson language um, for, you know, at two, so that everybody can understand what you're trying to say. You want to clearly identify, identify all sampling locations, catch basins, spill kits, etc. The SWIP should narrate how trainings are conducted. Here is a sample log of keeping track of uh, people coming in and for training. And now I'm going to show you a fun little spill kit video or spill response video. Meet John. He's going to help show you how to use your spill kit, just in case a spill happens at your facility. It's simple and could save you thousands of dollars in required cleanup costs. For example, this was John a year ago when he didn't have the right tools to manage a spill. He quickly learned that the spills that get into our storm drains end up in his local lakes, rivers, and streams, and that he could be fined by Tim, the otherwise friendly stormwater inspector, for not responding properly. Just look at the consequences. It's not pretty. 
Follow these six simple steps to avoid a messy spill. Number one, plan for the spill. John went to resourceventure.org and he got a free spill kit and help developing his spill plan. So he's pretty much ready for anything. He knows that the spills that enter storm drains need to be reported to Seattle Public Utilities right away. Number two, recognize and evaluate the spill. Evaluate the situation and select which type of spill kit would be best to clean up your spill. Be sure to put on the protective equipment found inside. Number three, stop the discharge. First, stop it at the source to make sure it does not continue to spread. There isn't a single way to do it. All spills are different. And sometimes, it requires getting a little creative and using equipment you might already have on hand. Number four, protect the drain. John uses the supplies in his free spill kit to block the storm drain, which keeps pollutants out of the system and gives him more time to focus on cleanup. Keeping pollutants out of the system will save John a lot of money in cleanup costs. Remember, if a spill reaches the storm drain, notify Seattle Public Utilities right away by calling 206-386-1800. Number five, now it's time for John to clean up the spill. Here, we see him using the booms, throwing them downstream of the spill's flow to stop its spread. He uses pads to soak up excessive liquids from reaching the storm drain. After you've saved the day, make sure to dispose of used materials appropriately. If you aren't sure how, call Resource Venture for guidance. Number six, evaluate and refill as necessary. Take steps to make sure the spill won't happen again. It'll save you time and money in the long run. If you need more materials, order them now so you'll be ready if a spill does happen. Crisis averted and the spill is resolved. Pretty simple, huh? Acting fast and taking action to prevent damage to the environment and your property will pretty much make you a hero. Like John here. Great job, John free help and answers to all of your questions, visit us online at resourceventure.org. Dollars and required cleanup costs. Ugh. Okay. Uh-oh. All right. That is something you could share with your staff to have some, you know, make it fun. Uh, I realize that it's Seattle-centric, but there's some good feedback there. Um, you, uh, now we're looking at inspections and record keeping. This is your single most important BMP that you can implement. You want to have a sample inspection sheet in the resource link and you want to take and adapt that to your facility. Again, it's so important that everything you do that's in your SWIP is adapted to your facility because you are a unique facility with unique issues and concerns. Um, you need to have mandatory visual inspections of the site each month and that they need to be conducted by a qualified personnel. That means the person who possesses the knowledge and skills to assess conditions and activities that could impact stormwater quality of the facility and evaluate the effect effectiveness of BMPs required by this permit. That if you're going through these trainings that will generally make you a qualified person. You wanna have multiple qualified personnel. As I mentioned earlier, you wanna have backup. If you are the main stormwater permit manager, you should not be alone. You should have somebody there that if it's raining and you're not there, they should be able to sample for you. Um, you want to make sure that your managers understand what you're up against and these kind of trainings help them understand that. You want to customize your inspection reports for your facility, check your files periodically at Ecology and make sure that they have all the documentation. You want to over document but you don't necessarily need to submit all the documents. This may be for your own reference. Um, you want to use a camera. Again, you don't necessarily need to submit them to Ecology, but it helps you and your staff manage your property and be well organized. Make sure that if you have documentation, it's well, um, well formatted so that people can easily find it. It shouldn't be stuck in a box in the back room someplace. It should be in a file drawer where people know where it is or in books on a shelf. 
Okay, the next type of BMPs are structural BMPs. These are physical, structural, or mechanical devices or facilities that are intended to prevent pollutants from entering your stormwater. You need to include structural BMPs listed as applicable in ecology's um, guidance documents and manuals. Some examples of structural BMPs include a roof structure that covers areas that would be impacting stormwater if, they're, if they were affected by rain, and also things like covering your alligator pavement. A lot of times with alligator pavement, it's collecting material when it's dry. So when it rains, those materials are lifted out of those cracks and um, transported across the surface of your property into the storm drains. By uh, covering them, when you do your sweeping and things like that, you, it will help keep your stormwater, keep your stormwater sampling in compliance. Some additional things, uh, structural BMPs, are things like berms, walls, barriers, spill pellets, decks, tanks. These are all really important structures and they need to be inspected so that to make sure they're not leaking um, and just making sure that they're working properly. Additionally, we were talking about um, your roofs, siding, drain pipes, fencing, etc., that can impact your stormwater bottom line, especially, gal especially galvanized metals that have zinc. Often by coating these materials, you can almost eliminate that zinc overnight. The third category of BMPs is called treatment. That's where you've done everything in the operational and structural and, your, and, and you do those first, but sometimes it's not enough. That's when treatment BMPs come in. They're intended to remove pollutants from the stormwater. It's required if you hit a level three corrective action, and we'll talk about that in another section, and you must obtain an ecology approval before beginning construction, installation of treatment BMPs. Okay, I'm gonna take a quick Q&A section here if there's any questions about what I've just covered and then we'll go into the mapping exercise. I'm not seeing any que questions. Um... I'll move on to the facility exercise then. So what we wanted to do was provide you an opportunity to um, take an example map so that you can potentially apply what we're going to talk about today to your own facility. So we've taken and created instructions here. You also should have a facility description and assessment of your facility's uh, Word document a one-page assess facility for pollution sources Word doc, and six maps, five that will deal with uh, the facility description, and one that you'll look at and do a facility assessment. Um, it's also good to have either colored pens or pencils to draw on so that you can kind of color code things. You're going to review the maps associated with the facility description and compare the list of SWIP requirements for the site maps. Identify and add site map requirements that are missing. So a few icons on the map that are not necessarily noted um, at the tops of the page are your storm drains, which are those kind of uh, rectangular blue squares, the storm lines, which are the blue lines, and an oil water separator. Then for the section, second section, for uh, map 2.1, you're going to review the site map and there is a series of um, icons to describe the various things on the site. So what we want you to do is think about what kind of best management practices or BMPs need to be applied on your site for each one of those pages and the things that can impact your site. So this is your facility description and assessment of facility. This comes straight out of the SWIP. 
on page 10 and 11 of the permit, or excuse me, this comes straight out of the permit on page 10 and 11. Um, what you're going to do is um, create several maps. And the reason why we're giving you several maps is it's really important not to overload a map with detail. It allows you to see things more clearly and address situations. So it's okay to have multiple site maps and have different things on them so they're more readable. So the first section, this facility description is for maps 1.1 to 1.5. This section is for map 2.1. Okay, so the first five, you'll look at these and get all the things listed on there and um, put them on your different maps. And then you'll look at 2.1 and see what it applies here. The other thing you're going to do is look at, assess your facility for pollutant materials. So I've kind of broken these down and it's not necessarily a complete list because every site is different, but these are some major things, the materials, activities, equipment, and buildings that will impact your storm water uh, quality. The first map, 1.1, kind of shows you what's going on around you. What do you need to consider with these external factors? You've got run on from a storage yard. How can you address that? You've got an industrial business over here that does machining. What are they going to be doing that could potentially impact your stormwater bottom line? And you've got a major highway out here that could also impact you. And finally, there, this area here is directly connected to a wetland. So what can you do so that maybe you disconnect to those wetlands? This map, 1.2, you want to note the distances on the property, like from end to end, side to side, from the building to the edge, perhaps the distance to the um, closest uh, storm drains, those kinds of things, okay? You want to uniquely um, name each storm drain. These are storm drains. and um, also, what general direction the stormwater flows? What else could be put on this map? You want to show direction of sheet flow, um, sampling locations, run on areas, areas of concern, such as a fuel station, and stormline flow. You want to show where the stormwater leaves your property and where it infiltrates. And finally, map 2.1, what you're going to do with all that information that you've got about your site, here's what's going on on your site. You've got unpaved areas, you've got alligator pavement, you've got metal and drums and run on, run off, tires, um, et cetera. What BMPs are you gonna implement here? What we'd like to do is give you the break time between now and one o'clock to work on these. And, um, also, uh, and so we'll come back and when we do that, we will be um, able to unmute you so that you can ask direct questions and also talk about what BMPs you would implement. Um, again, uh, Lori mentioned uh, the raise your hand. It should be in your control panel. If you have a question and would like to ask a direct question rather than writing it in the Q&A, please do so. Um, I, I did see one question for the exercise. Are there any additional ones? And uh, let's see if we can answer it. Okay. So there is one question about the exercise. Okay. Are we supposed to adapt these maps to our own buildings as best we can? Yes and no. <laughs> what, um, what our thought was, 
was that this is an example site to kind of get your thought processes flowing as to how this kind of information applies to your site. So this is just an exercise um, and we wanted to come back and maybe talk about it as a group. But yes, you should take these things, these considerations and apply them to your own site at another time. But one thing you can think about as you go through the exercise, what's going on on your site? How can you implement BMPs that would address certain things going on? So um, great question. And yes, uh, I really encourage you to, um, to think about your own site as you go through this exercise. Are there any additional questions? None in the Q&A box. Okay. Um, I encourage you uh, to take the time to do this. We did this in, um, in our first workshop that we held in person in February, and it was a great exercise to just start discussions and have people start thinking about their own facility. In fact, one guy, pulled out a piece of paper and started drawing his own facility and how it would impact. So you might take the time after doing the exercise and applying it to these maps, start thinking about your own facility and how it will apply. Okay, if there's no more questions, we're gonna go ahead and take a break for lunch and this mapping exercise and we'll see you back here at one o'clock. And thank you so much for being here and we look forward to seeing you again in the second half.